Thanks everyone for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hope everyone got a chance to have, have some lunch. Uh, so yes, uh, today uh, we're going to have a series of different talks and then a, a panel portion of this session as well. Um, the general topic is recommendation and learning uh, to improve personal productivity, or in other words, recommendation, recommendation and learning in privacy sensitive areas over personal data, enterprise data, and so forth. Um, the rough structure of the session is going to be, I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce some of the applications and areas that are of interest to Microsoft, some research that we've done. And then we have uh, three distinguished guests that will speak on research related to these areas. So uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Paul Bennett. I'm a researcher here at Microsoft Research, and I lead the Information and Data Sciences team. Uh, we do a variety of work at the intersection of what I consider information science and data science, and then we collaborate with other groups in Microsoft research uh, quite strongly, like Ryan White's uh, Knowledge Technologies and Experience Group, and Ahmed Awadallah's group, uh, Language Information Technologies, uh, in particular in these, in these domains, as well as a variety of product groups uh, in this space as well. So let me just start off with the notion of the personal web. And most of us are familiar with the global web, but we haven't really thought about what is the personal web and what does it look like. And the reason why we haven't thought is because often there's not explicit structure, but we all act with it every day. So for example, you can consider somebody who is currently doing something on their device, right? And in fact, what they might be doing is working on a Word document. As they're working on this Word document, they may save it to a folder, right? And as they're performing these activities, you're learning something about the structure of the world. So the Word documents are, I mean, Word is used to work on documents. It's saved to this particular folder. Then they get an email. They switch to email. This email is from some other person. And that has an attachment in it. They save the attachment to the same folder. So now we've learned a little bit more about the structure of their world. They have a question about this attachment they're reading. And they go off and they search for this on some search engine. Uh, being being will naturally come back with the answers. And as they're reading it in the browser, they may paste that answer back into the, the document. Now, they might get distracted while they're on the browser and go off and do some social networking. I know it probably doesn't happen to most people here, but I've heard this happens. Uh, and eventually, they might come back and to re return to this task. It might be on the same device. It might be on a different device. Now they open up an attachment in the same folder. And the question is, what do you know about this, their world? If you were to help them, how might you help them? So for example, if they were going to write an email, who would they most likely write an email to? If they were going to open up another document, which document would be? Right? So there's a lot of information latent in the structure of their personal web that is implicit in these links. And quite often, we miss even saving those. We don't keep the provenance of the information that this web page was where the material was sourced from. And if they open that document again, they might want to get back to the web page. So thinking through some of these recommendation and learning scenarios is a question of how do we bring this type of information together with all of the information they work with, whether it's from the global web or personal web, and enable them to perform the tasks that they want to do. More generally, uh, how I like to think of this is in terms of contextually intelligent assistance. People are working in order to do something. Um, and likewise, when you're doing things for your personal uh, uh, life as well, so for example, I'm researching a trip right now. Uh, I have a particular task in mind, and I'm choosing apps in order to do that. But the information across those are connected. And so if we think about providing assistance that says, how do we proactively bring to your attention the information you need at the right time, place, and context? So for example, if I went to this web page that you would actually say, hey, this is related to this email that your spouse just sent you. And in fact, they've commented on what they think about this. This would be an opportune time to bring these things together. But we're keeping these siloed according to how the apps live. So how would we learn and create scenarios around this? To take one view of this, we can look at how this happens in just email itself. So email has a rich lens into somebody's life, both personally and professionally. Uh, it contains a lot of different items beyond simple communications. One of the key things that it has are items to do. And so you could look at how do people actually say when they're going to do something, what requests do they get, how do they act on those things? Uh, so here's an example of an email, right? For those of you who have communicated with me, you know that sometimes I write too long of emails. Um, and this is an ex a real example of one. Uh, and within this, I said that I was going to do something, right? I said I'd share a particular deck with other people on the email thread. Um, probably because of the length of this email, I forgot that I said I would do it. Uh, 
And so the question is, how do you actually even act on the things that you said you're going to do? So Cortana has a feature where it's able to detect, hey, it looked like you were able to do something. By analyzing the email, I can tell that you've done something. Do you want to act on it or haven't? And if you've already acted on it, great. You get to check it off and you say, look, I'm happy I'm done with that. Otherwise, it's an implicit reminder of what, what you need to do. So this is work that um, Ryan White, Eric Horvitz, and I uh, collaborated with uh, folks in product groups in the uh, MSAI product group and Cortana in order to put this into production. But the interesting thing is, how does it actually look at your content and turn that into something actionable? Uh, in terms of what it allows people to do in terms of memory, we go from explicit reminders to having from implicit reminders potentially 100 times more surface area of where we can interact with people and say what you should act on. Some of the characterization of tasks that happen over reminders um, appears in two papers for people who want to look at it. Uh, work that um, uh, Ryan, Eric, and I did with uh, David Grouse, a former intern of ours. Uh, at UMAP, and then Ryan, Ahmed, and Robert Sim have a paper coming out just next week at CIR where they look at how people actually complete tasks and act on those. So it's a good understanding of how people perform in their daily lives. Now, what are this some of the challenges from a machine learning point of view? Well, there are billions of emails. In order to actually analyze every email, you have to deal with a tremendous number of latency constraints. There are also other forms of communications. There are Teams messages, there are calendar items, there's a lot of other things. You have to serve these things at very low latency, partially due to the number of messages, but also because when you get into an interactive loop, it turns out that there's a trade-off between relevance and latency. The longer you take, people just ignore your attempt at assistance because you're really just getting in the way by taking a long time. So there are uh, de demands on latency. There are also many different intents that we've already built models for, but there's a question of how do you identify more? Um, there's, a, there's a final interesting case. Email in some sense is the, in, the easy case because email is right once. You don't update it afterwards. But when you start building intelligent models over documents or other things that you can edit, the question is when do you perform the intelligent analysis? After it's saved, when it's closed, while the person is doing it, all of those have trade-offs in both the amount of information available, your latency demands, and what you can recognize. Uh, so there's lots of engineering challenges. Now looking forward research-wise, you could ask questions of how do you identify other intents? Uh, so for example, there are very general intents like provide payment, send invoice, delegate authority to do something on a particular system. And these are things that we've been able to pull out by using uh, canon and many methods and uh, actually um, uh, aggregating across users, verb, object, pairs, to kind of understand what's going on. But then there are things specific to an area. So for example, we know what academics might tend to do, like write a review or submit grades, but there are all parts of the world that have niche areas where we don't know what their key action items are, and how do we understand how that language goes to actions? More generally, when we think about how intents go to actions, think about how do those communications relate to other types of resources. So my files are not your files. So you might learn that when I get a certain type of content, I act on a particular file, but what is the way that we can generalize across users? And there's two challenges. One is the privacy challenge. The other is the fact that simply I'm acting on different <coughs> objects. So an example of this is you might recognize that this looks like an expense request, but each enterprise may actually have a different internal system for how they handle expenses, which grounds out in a different URL. And when, when you try to aggregate these, you can one way hash all those URLs, but they're not gonna look like each other. So how are you going to do this now that you're gonna recognize that this is serving the same semantic intent and the language is grounding out in the same basic action? And so when the new person comes into your organization and can't find the expense system, you might be able to recognize the language, but tying them to the action and helping them onboard is still challenging. Other cases where this comes up, um, oh, I forgot to mention in this case, uh, so there will be a paper next week at CIR where um, uh, a few Wei Wang cigar, Hussaini cigars in the back there, uh, will be giving the talk next week, looking at how we identify a variety of other intents from email, as well as use the full context of email. So uh, other cases where we look at contextual intelligence are things like meeting-related recommendations. So suppose that you want to prepare for a meeting. Uh, this is, again, a real example. Uh, Divya Sarwan is a student at uh, Carnegie Mellon right now. Uh, she's working with Christos Falustos, and right now she's working with me on some cases of analyzing productivity-related data. We had a meeting Friday. I'm flying in from an international flight and going straight to the meeting to meet with her uh, before the end of the week, and uh, I'm not caught up on things. I don't know what's most relevant. She sent me a variety of emails. These are not the only ones. But when I click on the calendar items, it's recommending to me 
what it thinks is most relevant to be prepared for this meeting. And so what you're thinking, what you see here is that the context is the meeting, and by thinking about how it interacts with these other objects, whether it's emails or documents, we can actually bring to someone's attention what you really need to know to walk into this and look prepared in the shortest amount of time. Here we are able to deal with some of the privacy challenges by looking at the similarities between the context, the meeting item, and the thing that's being recommended, emails and documents, and aggregate across users in that way. But in other cases, it's not so clear how we would create a privacy-preserving representation. And so our first priority is always to protect privacy. And so we may not develop some features that are conceivable because we're trying to run this balance of saying, how do we learn across users and how do we learn from individual behavior? Um, <clears throat> final example I'll give, it's a case of kind of making suggestions as you're building slide decks. So I've heard stories that some people, when they're creating slides, actually reuse their slides. Um, <laughs> they copy paste. I don't, I don't know that this really happens. Uh, but it turns out Office has a scenario where they support this. Um, uh, the last one I should mention was productized also by MSAI. This is uh, being done by an Office uh, group here, uh, OxoML and, uh, and Office itself, looking at how do we recommend what slides are relevant in context. So you'll notice this is the usual slide. This is the deck I'm preparing. The middle one is what I'm working on. And this is what might be relevant to insert here. And based on the content of what you're currently doing, so here it's the slide deck you're working on. That's the context. What might you want to pull in and experience this? And so uh, as a little preview to let you know that I do use our own features, here's the slide deck that I'm presenting now. You'll notice that the slide deck on the right says research challenges at the top right. Uh, so you can guess probably what's coming is let's talk about some of the research challenges. Um, so, uh, so what are the things that go on here? I mentioned this idea that you're operating over personal information. So there are disjoint subsets that you're dealing with. And so if you think about typical recommendation approaches like collaborative filtering, they're hard to apply here because I can't recommend my email and documents to somebody else. So what are the representations that we can learn across people? Likewise, we can learn just within a user, but when you learn within a user, you have a data sparsity problem. How much data do I need to build something that's effective? How do we maintain our privacy guarantees to reduce, um, when, given that we have reduced model, model builder visibility? So people can only certain, see certain things. I can look at this feature and say, is it working for me or not? That's great, if it's working for me, I need it working for all of our customers. Right? They don't do the same types of things that I do. How do we make sure that happens? Separating actions from goals, I'll go into a little bit more there and dealing with data skews, because these are both sets of problems that there's some progress in, but there's a lot more opportunity. So just to raise a few problems in people's minds, we often think about in the world of recommendation, that was a good idea if you clicked on it, but people's actions are not their goals. So for example, I might be working on a talk, and as I'm working on a talk, I go, wait, it's been a while since I checked my email. Let me go check my email and see if there's anything important there. Turns out there's nothing important there, but I get distracted by what's there. I start doing work and I go, oh yeah, I'm actually working on this talk. Let me close email and go back to this. I repeat this procedure. Now you're observing me, whether it's reinforcement learning, offline model, whatever, you will say, hey, I can predict what you're going to do. You're gonna to go to email. I can make that simpler for you, right? I can make it less friction for you to open your email. And guess what? I will click on that. Now we essentially have productivity clickbait. How do we get back to the case of saying, what are your goals? And we still don't have a good way to elicit from people what their goals are. How do we get back from them, whether they're satisfied or not? And this is ongoing work to understand how do we measure this? How do we measure satisfaction in this space? All right, so um, I'm gonna go through the last part quickly to get to our speakers. Last is if we think about what does it mean to be a machine learning pipeline? So the canonical example that people often think about is, you design, you do some data collection, you roll your model out, you know, you have a runtime model, everything works, you go have a party, you move on to the next project. Uh, but this is really much more like a life cycle. And so you think about, well, within this whole plan, I'm going to be moving along different steps, and as I gather more data, I might roll something more back, something out that's improved, but along this step, what can go wrong in data collection and learning from models? So the number one thing that goes wrong is training data often doesn't look like what it is once it's deployed. Now, why is that the case? Well, it turns out you didn't collect all your training data from the entire world. Okay, that's simple. I just need to create, uh, collect more training data. Well, when you're planning new features, it turns out there is no training data like what you're deploying. What you look at is you look at log data from similar scenarios. So looking at slide reuse, we know that people open multiple slide decks at the time. We know they paste them in. 
but it turns out because of how they get to them in different ways, it will never look quite like our scenario. And so what you're really trying to do is say, I have something that looks like that scenario, which has some presentation bias that I don't know how it behaves because it's not in the same way, it's not a nice ranked list, I can't think about randomly reordering my results, but if I could, I knew how to deploy it to a global world, so how do we get past that problem? And then, you know, one of the more interesting cases is this one, this is where we're best. Log data from the same scenario and the global distribution once deployed. Now this one's easy, right? Well, it turns out, yes, it's easier, but there's a lot of things that can go wrong. One of the things that we think about is how do we deploy things? Well, it's easy, I just scale it out, right? I have my set of people that I test things with and then I roll it out to a broader, broader set, right? And in the ideal case, everything looks like the center and it's just a matter of scaling it out more. But it turns out when you're working in these areas, the scale looks something more like this. So the inner thing might be Microsoft and I'm testing it internally. And most of Microsoft may look like similar sets of behavior. There are these weird blobs in there that look different from each other. And then the rest of the world looks nothing like it. Some of the other ones, maybe these are tech companies, look a lot like it, but a lot of people behave differently. So how do you get insights there? How do you get feedback of whether it's working? And if, they, if, if your customers aren't working directly with you, how will you instrument that in a way that you know is appropriate? In terms of uh, um, some of the biases that come up, even in the similar scenario that are challenging, so besides the training data is not being representative, there's all sorts of things, so for example, Inventory change, even when you never actually changed your model and you have the deployed feature. Say you actually have a bunch of things come online, so you're, a, you're an enterprise customer, you just acquired another company. Guess what, you just got access to 100,000 files. Your inventory just changed, and now you have no data over that. From a point of view of reweighting the data, you've never seen behavior on that. How are you going to deal with those challenges? So there are a variety of ways in which things can go wrong, knowing about them, discovering and dealing with them, are some of the things that we look at. All right, um, so uh, there's also a, a white paper available that Fernando Diaz and Emery Kitchman and others talk about more general data biases that I encourage you to read. And with that, I'm gonna wind up there. I'll take one question and then we'll move on to the next speakers before the general panel, so thanks. <laughs> In back. There's a, a mic if you just wait just a second. I'm just very curious about this ring, the testing scenario. You first go to your dog footing and then you go outside further and further. Um, could you, uh, that's really interesting. If everybody's doing that, there must be some systematic failures and you hinted at some of them. Could you say more about that? Yeah, I mean, process? so um, I don't know about systematic, so there are different ways to get at that. The, the drawing is just one. So for example, in other scenarios where um, social networks are uh, used a lot more, uh, so for example, uh, if your kids play Pokemon Go, Niantic, that company just rolled out a new game, uh, Wizards Unite, uh, it was available first in New Zealand. Why was it available first in New Zealand? Because it turns out their social network is isolated from the world and it creates a great test case where most of the links are cut off and you can test independently. Depending on your feature, rolling out in rings or rolling out in isolated bunches may make more or less sense. So if you're depending on communication, you better make sure that you know, if, if me having the feature depends on you having the feature, that has to be accounted for in how you roll it out. So the rings are one version of the world, but there are other world ways in which we think about scaling those things out in individual segments. Right, Jennifer? Yeah. Okay. All right, so our next speaker is Jennifer Neville. Uh, Jennifer is a professor of both computer science and statistics at Purdue, and uh, she does a variety of work on machine learning, uh, specifically targeted at graphs. Uh, deep learning over graphs, and uh, also has been looking recently at student productivity from instrumentation they have. So with that, I'll let Jennifer take it away. Oh, I don't have a clicker, but then I need but to... But that way up to that. Yeah. Hold on, I'll get my own. I have my bag of dongles. Have dongles will travel. Okay, let's try this. Okay, that works. So, um, thanks Paul for having me here for this panel. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story today about my work with the people at Purdue in the Office of Institutional Research. Um, so this is how you get 
faculty to work for you. You give them data and you say, I'll give you really rich data set if you just consult for me while we try to do these thousands of different data science problems. So um, some of the stuff in this talk that will show up on the slides is the official outcomes that I can talk about that we've published on, but I'm also happy to take questions and sort of talk unofficially about what we're doing. Um, okay, so uh, probably starting about five years ago, Purdue started coalescing the data sets that they have around campus to try to create a large behavioral data set that they can use to analyze to improve students' satisfaction, performance, retention, and so on at, at Purdue. Um, this data that I started working with specifically at the beginning with them is data that they have on the temporal and spatial behavior of the students as they go around campus. I should state that differently. They have this data about everybody on campus, including the faculty, the staff, and the students. And what they're doing is tracking all of your devices as they hit the Wi-Fi and they have to resolve the password to let you on the Wi-Fi. They can track which access points you're going to for how long throughout the day um, for your entire life that you spend on the campus. Um, so we have very rich data about what they're doing from their use of Wi-Fi. We have data from all their different devices, including the devices that never leave their dorm rooms. And we also have data about the card swipes that they use with their cards that they pay for, they get into the gym and they pay for their meals at the dining halls and the different cafeterias. Um, and food service places. And so from this, they have been um, collecting this data on the temporal and spatial behavior for about um, three years now. And so it's a huge, massive amount of data, and there's lots of noise, there's uncertainty. Um, as, as an example of the uncertainty, sometimes you can show up being in two very different access points at the same time. It's not clear how the same device would be recorded in two separate places across campus that are not next to each other, um, but somehow that just goes into the data. Uh, they also have clearly have data on the students and their activity in classes and their performance over time, but as more and more of the classes use um, these uh, learning instructional systems like Blackboard or Piazza, they have rich information about how the students are actually engaging in the system over time during the class rather than just what they've submitted and the grades on what they've submitted over time. So there are things like discussions that they have, um, feedback that they get, questions that they ask for um, as they're doing homeworks in Piazza. And so there's a bunch of other faculty that are doing like natural language processing on the actual text of uh, the details of how these students interact with these systems. And then we have information about the social behavior of the students. Um, this is a little more indirect because we, and this is actually what I'm working on mostly at this point, um, is that we're trying to infer who are friends with each other actually based on the Wi-Fi and card swipe data that we have above. So there's no clearly articulated friendship relationships between the students. We might have housing information so we know who their roommates are um, and how those change over time as long as they're on the Purdue campus. But based on their interactions over time and where people co-locate for periods of time together, we are trying to infer who is friends with whom and how those change um, over the course of their lifespan at Purdue. So what we started doing and what I'll talk about officially in this talk is our analysis of this check-in data where we tried to look at the temporal patterns of where students went on campus and try to learn a model to predict when they're in a particular place at a particular time where to recommend that they would go next. And the one thing I want to point out here is that this type of educational check-in data is very different than the publicly available check-in data from things like Foursquare or Yelp because in those cases people are only going to um, go to venues very infrequently. So you tend to go to new places to have dinner or new places to see a movie. Um, and at Purdue in the educational data, you're very quickly just going to the same places over and over again. And so we have very dense visitation information and we have um, very quickly people have 
fall into a particular pattern of behavior. And so what's very different here is the number of new POIs, POIs are place of interest, I think is what it stands for. Um, and so it's the, the places that they go to, you can see that the number of new places they go drops very rapidly over the number of weeks in the semester. And so if we're going to learn a model to suggest to people where they should go um, based on where they've recently been, the target audience for this at Purdue would be the new students in their first semester because really you're only going to help people with your predictions in this range right here where they're figuring out where to go on campus. Oh, I should go back here and say, this is just a density plot to show you that um, most of the students are spending most of their time in the dorms. This also um, actually was surprising to me as we analyzed this, um, but since we have data for the entire 24-hour period, if you actually take into account the fact that they're sleeping with all their devices in their dorm rooms, there's actually a huge skew in the data towards people being in dorm rooms compared to, say, an academic building like the CS building. So just in case you're interested in how the data looks, here is a comparison of the temporal patterns of behavior between the students who are computer science majors and the students who are pharmacy majors. And what I'm showing you here is the hour of the day, and this is a heat map, so a darker um, bar means they spend more time there. And then these are the different activities. So we have in the access points, we have the buildings that they're associated with, and we could go down to the granularity of knowing which exactly is a classroom or where in the building um, the access point is, but that actually would take extra work to annotate it that way. So what we really have is just an overall classification of the, build, the entire building that they're in. And so we can categorize things based on residences or places where there's recreational activities like the gym. And um, dining halls, oh, I'm sorry, gym is separate here because that's a separate building by itself. So these must be other places of recreation that are not just the gym. And then we have places where there aren't classrooms, so they're primarily places they would go to study, including the libraries. And then we have classrooms and other, in, other places on campus. So you can see that there's a little bit of a difference between the patterns across the different majors. So um, maybe you can't tell it in this version of the plot, um, but what's, what is different here is that the pharmacy students seem to be in class in a much um, smaller region of time throughout the day where the CS students are spread across a larger range of times. And um, what was the other thing that they did? The pharmacy students also tend to work out in a very regular schedule. So if you start to look at this very closely, it seems like the CS students have a much more wider range of behaviors because their classes are spread um, over a wider period of time and that the pharmacy students tend to stick to very um, a more regulated schedule. Okay, so that was just a taste of the kind of data that we have. Um, so in terms of the kinds of analysis tasks that Purdue wants to use these data for is that they want to do all the same kinds of things that all big organizations would want to do with the data that they have available. They want to use the predictions to make better decisions to improve their allocation of resources and um, specifically to improve how they target the resources to students. And so specifically, the, the one statistic that Mitch Daniels, the president of Purdue, wants to um, try to impact is the time to graduation. And so um, most uh, university settings, they, that's one of their metrics that they try to improve on. And so what they want to do is have more students graduate quickly. And by quickly, that means in four years <laughs> and not longer than four years. And so that's really what they're focused on. And to do this, what they want to do is help to identify students that are having problems and solve them more quickly, and also to give recommendations to the students in terms of how to set up their schedule and if they want to change majors, how to find a major that is going to have the least impact on their time to graduation, if that's what they care about. So specifically, the sort of machine learning tasks that I've um, discussed with them 
and so either someone is working on it or they're thinking about how to work on it, is that they want to see in the social network behavior and the temporal patterns on campus, they want to identify the kinds of activities that seem to increase the student's sense of belonging and to identify students that aren't engaged in those kind of activities so that they could suggest them to them more often. Because one of the things that they found is that the students who are spending more time on campus, doing activities on campus, seem to be the ones that are happy with um, their experience at Purdue and also tend to stick around and graduate. Um, they have, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to think about what I can say with respect to this. So they have been doing analysis on the difficulty of classes and the success rates and the um, the impact on students when they take certain sets of classes together in the, in the same semester to try to make suggestions to the students as to the difficulty level of the types of classes that they've decided to take in a particular semester and with potentially the um, looking downstream to their entire four-year plan. And um, I'll come back to this um, issue later when I talk about the reaction to this from the students and the faculty. Um, and then I mentioned already that um, they want to be able to identify the impact based on changes in majors. And so in order to figure out um, this impact, they have to actually know the prerequisite chains and the, um, the sets of uh, the logic that you have to satisfy to get a degree in a particular major, and to be able to calculate the distance or estimate the distance if you're going to change from, say, an engineering major to a computer science major, or from a computer science major to a nursing major, and um, that they want to be able to give that information to the students as they think about um, changing their major. I guess this might be something specifically important for Purdue because the students have to declare their major before they get to campus. And so that's not something I'm doing, huh? Santa Claus. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think there's uh, a lot of students that come in with having potentially picked the wrong major, and um, it's uh, sometimes difficult for them to think about how to change in a way that doesn't make them take more than four years to graduate. Um, then there's a whole bunch of other kinds of tasks that the administration would want to do to uh, deal with the load that we have recently based on the huge influx of students that we have. Um, so we don't have enough housing on campus. In computer science, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, we don't have enough faculty, we don't have enough classrooms, um, so there's a huge increase in the number of students. And being able to plan for that and figure out um, how to allocate the classrooms and the housing like a year ahead of time and to know which faculty that need, how much hiring you need to do, they need to have a lot of simulation and planning um, uh, structures set up and um, specifically what they would like to do is to be able to do simulations where they figure out if they let in another 5,000 students. This is how we keep uh, the tuition constant. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to stop. I've run out of time. Oh my goodness. Okay, I haven't even gotten to the, the good parts. Okay, I'm gonna not finish, but I'm gonna go faster. Okay, um, so I will skip the detail. Okay, so I'll skip through this. I want to talk about the privacy issues here um, because this is where we had some surprising um, reaction. So the, when we started collecting this data, and we being Purdue started collecting this data, the students, I guess, agree to the collection of this data when they sign up for and register for classes. And when we started doing this analysis, I was very concerned that everybody would sort of be up in arms that we're using this data to make predictions about the students. And so they had a town hall meeting or multiple town hall meetings where they discussed with students and faculty what they were planning to do. And actually, surprisingly, the students cared nothing at all about the privacy issues. They just wanted the results of all of these predictions avail available to them as soon as possible. And so can you guess who had the most complaints about the privacy issues? 
It was the faculty <laughs> had the most complaints. And do you know why that was the case? It's because they actually were talking about this assessment of the difficulty of the classes. And the faculty didn't want students driven away from their classes because they got a grade of being a difficult class. And so actually, as you sort of dig into it, and, and I just was introspective about it myself when I thought about the analysis being done on me and my classes, I think that what happened is the, when the perceived uh, benefit of the analysis is great, in which case the students thought it would make it easier for them to choose a reasonable schedule, they actually wanted to proceed with this, but the faculty felt that they were being judged and evaluated in ways that they didn't agree to to begin with, and so um, that actually killed this part of the project. Okay, wait, I'm not finished yet. You can't stand up yet. I'm gonna keep <laughs> talking. I have a whole paper. You can read the details of this embedding model to, um, to do these predictions, so I won't talk about the, the details of our paper, but I did want to get to this list of machine learning issues because Paul asked us to talk about this, and I think a lot of them are very similar to what you brought up. So, um, so I think that some of the details in doing this modeling that makes it very difficult to just roll out off-the-shelf machine learning methods are that you were combining data from many different sources that have many different levels of granularity. So this Wi-Fi access data is huge. It's every 10 seconds of every day of every year that people are moving around campus. That's a, at a very different level of granularity than the students' grades at the end of a, of a semester. Right? And um, so that's made it difficult to put everything together. Um, the prediction targets are very difficult to set up, and I guess Paul talked about this a little bit. Um, we have considered the prediction of just where will you go in the next time step, or what will your grade be in this course, but in the long run, what we want to do is improve um, people's satisfaction with their life at Purdue, and that's a very vague and nebulous concept because you don't want to just push everybody into the easiest courses possible so that they get high grades and are happy with their life at that point because some people need to be in the hard classes to get through and actually learn something in their degree. Um, and also we have this issue with correlation versus causation because they, um, the behaviors that we see in the past that lead to good performance and good outcomes are not necessarily behaviors that if you tell another class of students or another category of students to do, that that will actually lead to good outcomes for them. And so a very simple and funny example of this is one thing that they found very early on is that they found that uh, students who registered early tended to do well in their classes. And so without any consultation with people who know about data science, they started rolling out an app to encourage people to register early, <laughs> which of course is not going to have any impact on um, people's performance over time, right? So it's just the people who are actually diligent and will do well in their courses who thought to register early without the prompting. And also I want to point out that there's really complicated trade-offs with respect to students' lives and the other issues that they're dealing with while they're at Purdue. A lot of times the students that are struggling are students who've come in that aren't really prepared for the kind of classes that they have to take or maybe don't have the means to just do classes and so they're working 20 hours a week as well as doing all their classes to try to support themselves. And so suggesting certain kinds of behaviors um, that are unrealistic for them to be able to achieve is something that has to be taken into account. I have one more slide. Let's, let's take some of them in the okay. this slide period. So. Okay, I will uh, just leave it there and you can read <laughs> it. Uh, thank you. All right. One question maybe about the slide while Chris, Chris is coming to the front and switching over. Uh, let's go ahead and go back there. Thanks. Um, I have this question that actually could be addressed by the whole panel later, but which is about the privacy. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, that privacy perception by the students, faculty. So first off, I think what I would cons what I would characterize uh, from the faculty is more of a disclosure issue rather than privacy. It's sort of 
Uh, but, 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 but more importantly, um, the privacy thing, because I've also done this kind of stuff, collecting data from students and others, um, and no matter how much you tell them about what we're doing and you know, trying to be ethical, often people have a hard time really appreciating that issue of privacy. Um, and so, sure, we have their permission to use their data, collect data from them, but I'm not convinced that they really understand what the harm could be. And, and so they're giving us permission, and this, this, this goes to all kinds of other services that collect this kind of data, and, and we all sign the terms of agreement and whatever. Um, and, and I'm not sure where this should be addressed in terms of, you know, in academic kind of setting and in the industry setting, but, but I think this privacy, just because we have that permission and we have done all the right things from the IRB standpoint, um, it, to me it's still a little, little iffy thing, and, and I think it requires broader discussion than yeah, so absolutely, I agree with that. Um, one thing that I want to point out here at Purdue, one of the reasons to do this analysis is that there simply aren't enough resources for advisors and sort of hands-on interaction with humans and the, and the students, right? And so in this case, the goal of all of this analysis is to target those resources in the best way possible. And that's very different than somebody taking your data and advertising to you or um, you know, denying you health insurance. It's not, it definitely needs to be discussed, but I think that there's actually different issues here. And I think the reason the students were so excited about having this happen is that they really are yearning for that extra insight that they think is there historically. So right now it's information that they get just from talking to other students about which are the good classes and when, how should I take them and I should take it now because I might fail it and I need time to take it again um, so that I can graduate on time. These are all things that are being passed you know, um, through personal experiences right now and if that could be codified in a way that it's available to all the students, I think that, that there's, there's a case for a, a, a big impact in that way, which offsets some of the potential downfalls. Um, but certainly, people are going to start seeing the downfalls, right? So here's an example. I, if, I think some of this will come back oh, to yeah, the yeah. panel. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. <laughs> Let's you, thank you. the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our next speaker is uh, Chris Ray. Uh, Chris is an associate professor at Stanford. Um, and he'll be talking to us about some of the ways that people are thinking about broadening what we think of as supervision and how people might act on data in order to improve the models that we have. Awesome. So one thing that was in the pre-see for, uh, for this session that was really exciting is working on private data. And in another life, as a result of an acquisition, I actually work on uh, another assistant, uh, Siri. And it's really an important problem. So I want to implore you that those first problems about how you do machine learning in private settings and places where people really take it seriously, I think, is, a, is just a really interesting and challenging question. I won't talk about anything from my Apple life. I'm just going to talk about Stanford work uh, and talking here just about how we have been thinking about program programming by constructing training sets. And I'll walk you through why we started this idea. And it took off a little bit more than we expected. The reason, I think, is honestly this cast of great characters, Box at Brown, uh, Alex Ratner, will be up here in the Pacific Northwest uh, sometime very soon on the faculty of, of Washington. Okay? So here's the, here's the overview of how we got started. So to a first approximation, you know, machine learning applications have a model, they have some training data, and they have some hardware. And this has really been kind of the sauce that's powered a huge range of really exciting industrial and scientific applications. But we started to notice a couple years ago that the model was kind of becoming a commodity. If you wanted the latest and greatest model, you could you know, go out to the wonderful people at Hugging Face, install BERT, and it's like one line to be able to get it. Oh, you wanted ExcelNet that came out last week? Well, Tom Wolf just posted it on Monday, and they're off to the races you are with the world's great, you know, greatest pre-trained model. Hardware at a, at a second tier cloud vendor, uh, you can get you know, instances whenever you want. <laughs> um, if this is recorded, Amazon, I still love you. But anyway, so uh, you, know, you can get instances whenever you want. If your system you know, needs a little bit more memory or a couple more GPUs, well, then I just I put dash dash, you know, larger instance type in, and I'm kind of off to the races. And the point is, in a real way for developers, when they sit down to build a machine learning problem, state-of-the-art models and pre-training, or even the architectures that are out there, are pretty readily available to them, as are uh, huge amounts of hardware. 
But the bottleneck is that training data usually isn't. And so we started really seriously thinking about why isn't training data more of a commodity? Why don't you have more stuff to effectively start from? And could we start to put this problem on really formal mathematical ground? Now, there'll be, this is going to be really high level. There'll be no math in this talk whatsoever. But that's basically where we spent the last three years of our lives. So we started to look at what people were doing in our own applications and academia and, and also in industry. And we started to see that people weren't taking training data that was sort of you know, the classical thing. You know, when I, I the first lecture of machine learning when I taught in the spring, you know, X and Y pairs come. Where do they come? Well, they come from God herself, and then machine learning starts. But actually, those X and Y pairs that we care about actually are really coming through processes. People are building them up in various different ways. And there's a lot of structure in where those Ys are coming from. People use things like pattern matching, distance supervision, you know, data augmentation, taking their existing data and changing it in cool ways, topic modeling to figure out. This is actually one that's really popular in, in a lot of the web companies. Third party models, crowdsourcing, and so on. And so these training points that are coming in, they're not really of equal quality. They're of really radically differing quality. And people were applying these weak supervision techniques in kind of ad hoc ways. And so all we wanted to do was take all the different sources that were out there and be able to allow you to put them into one framework and combine them. And that's what we spent our time doing theory about. Okay? So I won't go into the details. It's this project called Snorkel. Uh, but it was just formalizing this programmatic notion of, of labeling and augmentation and, and something we call slicing. There's blog posts and code. And you know, if you really care about the details, it's all online. And so we started building this up to try and understand how we could combine all those different sources of weak supervision in one platform. And what we started to realize after we build that is that's actually the dominant way at least some engineers for some problems were approaching it. They weren't changing the model anymore. They were just changing the supervision. There are people in industrial settings, and I'll talk about a couple, that never write a, code of, a line of code of like PyTorch or TensorFlow, nothing at that low level. They only modify the training data and monitor it over time. And that's a pretty exciting shift in computing. All right, so how does this work just for context? Users write their labeling functions or their augmentation functions over here. Basically, what happens is we, we think that those augmentations and those, those labeling functions are not of, of uh, high quality or of known quality. We're going to have to estimate their quality. We're also going to have to estimate their correlations. So that looks like to machine learning people, like estimating the parameters of a graphical model. The problem is we don't assume that we see the training data. So the why is unobserved. It's latent. And so we basically have to do structure learning and parameter learning, but without ever seeing the why. So how do we do that? Well, because we have multiple sources, we actually get multiple views on the same data. And our basic theory is about when you can do this and when you cannot. Okay? Now, once that's done, once we get the parameters of that label model, we basically create a probabilistic training set. So we generate a bunch of points. And then we assign to every point a confidence, if you like, of how likely we believe that point is accurate. And then we can put that into any kind of downstream model. If you want to get really into the details, you just rip off the losses and make them aware that they're being sampled stochastically. Okay? So this is the general framework. Now, the point is probabilistic training data and no training data in the conventional sense really needed. But this allows us to build applications, hopefully, much more quickly and capture what people were doing anyway without any of that hand-labeled data. All right. So why the heck would you do this? So I'll give you three slides to overview why this is not a totally insane idea. The first thing that you get is actually improved generalization. We actually have theory about this, but also practically, when people use those weak supervision methods, they often are using very precise rules, or they're using kind of brittle code. They have rules that are laying around, and they're not able to take advantage of these wonderful machine learning models that allow them to generalize and, and capture kind of the distinct patterns or the linguistic variation or all the image variation that they've seen. And so this allows us to get dramatically higher recall in real applications, both scientific and industrial applications. Okay. And this is just a slide basically giving you an example of that. Someone writes a labeling function maybe of like kind of a standard distant supervision or a keyword-based thing. And we get the synonyms for it kind of for free in this approach. Okay. A second reason, and this is one that catches on especially with industrial companies. So training data is a depreciating asset. As soon as you collect conventional training data, it's out of date. We heard in, the, you know, in Paul's talk at the beginning, you're always in this kind of cold start problem, and you're always changing when you, re when you release a product. As soon as you release a product and something starts working, hopefully users start to use it, and your entire distribution changes. And so you're constantly in this case where you've labeled for the data you had or what you thought you were going to have prospectively, as Paul was talking about, and then the world changes out from underneath you. But if the labels are all on that old set, you're toast. 
And so what this allows you to do is basically take this unlabeled data and pipe it through those functions again and again and again, even if it's imperfect. And so you see this kind of nice scaling that as more unlabeled data is coming in, we're actually getting to higher quality. The last bit is touching on this knowledge transfer issue again. This is something with Stanford Hospital. The details aren't super important, but basically the idea is we're trying to build something that allows you to do, like a lot of folks, look at a radiograph and be able to diagnose certain conditions. The way this is typically done is you sit down with a bunch of radiologists, you actually a committee of radiologists, and they label those, those images again and again. Okay? This is important to do. But that's a really slow and expensive process. Now we do have lots of radiographs with reports from places that are laying around. We don't have those reports when the person comes in because you use the radiograph to write the report, but we can use those reports to supervise the image classification. So this transfer across modality is quite useful. You have, image, you have data for one purpose and you're able to repurpose it using these weak supervision techniques. And again, people have been doing this for the last 10 or 15 years, but somehow we still maintain that those X and Y pairs are just falling out of the sky. And so we wanna model that process and then build tools around it. And that's what those folks did, right? So to recap why you might do this and what the differences are between manual kind of conventional labeling, in labeling, your first label and your last label basically take the same amount of time. You don't get any speed up or scale. It's expensive, you need people to do it. And as I mentioned, it's static. If you change the classes you're after, you introduce a new feature, then what are you gonna do with all that old label data? You have to be able to port it over in some way for a new application. And so in contrast, these programmatic labels, there's a little bit of time to be able to, to deal with them, but then as soon as you get them in, you can run dramatically faster. You run at the speed of like running Python maps over huge amounts of data, so that's really exciting. They're hopefully a lot cheaper, because again, we're using the second tier cloud vendor. If we just use Azure, it'd be like one cent an hour. <laughs> so you can still run all of these different things. And hopefully it's dynamic. As I mentioned, when the tasks change, you can repurpose uh, training data. So to be clear, that training data is depreciating, but hopefully not as quickly as it was in the first case. Okay. All right. So the last thing I wanted to mention about what we're doing in this thing is that we're trying to build this analogy of now you're writing programs to, to create data. You can kind of think about manual labels as the ones and zeros of traditional machine learning, just like the ones and zeros of traditional machine language. And with full analogy to the stack that you can create from assembly language to high level languages and declarative languages, we've been tried to be inspired by these to be able to create a parallel stack on the supervision side over the last three years. And on the blog, you can go and check the different papers that we've written, well, some with industrial partners, some with scientists, about filling out this stack. So here I talked about labels from code, data augmentation. Really, this is still like the low level of like creating zeros and ones, new pairs. But you can do things like take advanced primitives to do these kinds of systems and combine them. That's a, a, a series of papers written by Paroma where she uses these advanced primitives to build these labeling systems dramatically more efficiently. Uh, things like synthesis fall into this bucket, being able to synthesize examples. We also have not people who can't code. We were working with some neuroscientists. They didn't know any Python, but they could write precise English. And we took that precise English and we would basically translate it using, uh, at first, one of Percy's semantic parsers, uh, which was a great collaboration, Percy Liang, to try and generate these labeling functions from natural language nearly automatically. And then finally, and perhaps most crazily, we've been looking at things where it's sort of observational. And this is where we get into some of the things that I think are really starting to talk about the personal web and why I put this slide in here, which is we want to learn from the entire, as we call it, exhaust. Everything that someone is doing when they're interacting with a system leaves behind some kind of digital trace. We focus on developers because those are the folks that we have the most access to. But the personal web has very similar kinds of characteristics. You're clicking here, you're doing things. What can we do observationally? What we're doing right now is that Facebook basically gave us a bunch of eye trackers, and physicians right now have switched their mental model. They love machine learning people. If you show up and say, like, strap this to your face 10 years ago, they would have punched you. Now they put it on, they wear it all around campus, like they're one of the cool kids. So we get a lot of data from this observational thing of what are they looking at, what are they clicking on, and we're trying to figure out what we can do to learn from that. Okay? All right, so check it all out. It's on Snorkel. I didn't, wanna, I didn't put citations on the slides, but they're, they're all in these series of blog posts. All right, that's the blog. Now, 
I feel obligated. I like, I really love NLP people because they hate leaderboards more than the vision people. The vision people love leaderboards. The NLP people just like snark about them. Um, but they still show that you're actually able to do something. And so I like that. So you can actually get, you know, with these training data first approaches, you know, state of the art results. At one point on March 22nd, uh, we were number one on this glue benchmark, which are these big multitask general language understanding. Then Microsoft and Alibaba managed to crush us mercilessly afterwards. I will point out that uh, Microsoft uh, and what they did, which was really cool, was they used a lot more weak supervision on a particular task called the Winograd schema to crank it up. And they're both sponsors of the lab, so we, we really love them. Um, and thank you so much for crushing us. Anyway, uh, <laughs> super glue, no one seems to be really submitting to super glue. Uh, unfortunately, we are number one. I'm not sure how strong a statement that is right now. Um, at least on July 1st, we were, I, I haven't checked recently. But the point is, these are all gains that you get from manipulating training data, and they're dramatically higher than uh, uh, sort of things that are uh, on the pre-training side, which is cool. Now, you may think this is something that's confined to academia, and from this pitch, that would be a pretty reasonable guess. Shockingly, our friends over in Mountain View actually picked this up due to the great work of a person at Stephen Bach. I should plug his work. He's amazing. He's a professor at Brown, if you see him. He's also extremely nice, so go ahead and talk to him. Uh, he, won't, he won't bite you. Um, but he basically went over there, and we collaborated in the lab to build this version that they call Snorkel Dry Bell, which is running in production at Google. Uh, the few people who uh, built it were all from ads. Uh, it's spreading. Uh, people are, more people are using it. We're really excited to support it. Basically, what they did is take all of the organizational resources that they had internally and kind of put them into that labeling framework, that augmentation framework, and they actually saw you know, improvements, as was documented in a very recent paper and blog post uh, on the AI blog over there about why this actually improved a lot of their models. And it had to do, again, with this being able to transfer data to different contexts in really interesting ways. One thing I'll mention is this idea of servable versus non-servable features. Uh, this is pretty interesting. There's a lot of times when you have great signal that you just aren't going to have at test time. And figuring out that split is super exciting and interesting. All right, so I will, fi I will finish. Uh, Programming supervision is effective. When we started this, we really had most people thought we were crazy when I would say we're going to program by supervision, but I think that's actually a really reasonable way to do things. And in fact, people were doing it that way anyway. A second thing is this idea of data exhaust is really driving our work. What are the weak signals that are out there that we can learn from? And I think that's a really exciting area for machine learning to go in, and especially some of these kind of personal uh, information sources that were described in the first talk. And the last thing I'll say is check out the blog for details. Someone has managed to use the code who's outside the lab. That's the most that I will vouch for it. Thanks so much. So. Eugene, while you come up, uh, we'll take one question for Chris as well. Uh, is there one here? All right. Let me follow up with a question myself then. So one of the things that you said that piqued my interest was the getting uh, uh, non-machine learning ex experts to describe precisely supervision using natural language. Um, have you tried this with others outside of, like, how many different fields have you tried this with where people can specify that's a, what they're looking that's for? That's a really interesting thing. So we tried it with neuroscientists. The other place that is really exciting is inside the law. They, those folks tend to write precise kinds of language, and so we're really excited over there. Actually, the place that that kind of reasoning has caught on the most is inside kind of labeling frameworks. Uh, so big companies often have huge fleets of labelers. They're writing a spec, and those specs tend to be actually in English and written in a fairly precise way. And sometimes there's some transfer you can get from there. The question of how broad or narrow applicable that technique is, I don't know. And also, ours was kind of like at the stage where I would say, you know, it's not how well the bear is dancing, it's that the bear is dancing. Like, we got some lift from it, but we have no idea how to expose natural language in a, in a better and more systematic way. All right, let's Thanks. thank the speaker again. Thanks. <laughs> Doesn't seem to quite be showing here. Hmm. So while we get this one showing, I should say we pre-gamed in lunch and talked about uh, extending talks a little bit because it seemed like a lot of time for panel. Uh, we'll get time for a few questions. Is this one? Yeah. Oh, is it this other one? Yeah. I might hit the help AV button while we do the rest of this. Uh, is there like a Windows P? Extend, how about duplicate? Uh, is that in the right? Okay, I'll turn off the help then before they come. <coughs> Go ahead. So uh, our next, uh, our last speaker is um, Yejin Choi. Yejin is a professor here at University of Washington. Um, she is both an, uh, 
in the linguistics uh, and the computer science department, social science uh, as well? No, 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 just the computer science, okay, actually. Just, okay. Um, and uh, she's going to be talking to us some about common sense and how we bring common sense into our interpretations of automatically doing things with language. So. Uh, actually, maybe I'm affiliated in the lingu linguistics department as well, but primarily 100% with the CSE. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different now. Um, this doesn't really work. So um, this uh, question about personal productivity requires us being able to observe what people are doing. And then uh, out of that, so like we observe emails and photos and videos, and then we can infer what people really want to do, their intents and goals and emotions. Uh, and this question was one of the important topics in Paul's opening speech as well. And then out of that, we wish that machine and humans together are going to act on some actionable things um, uh, soon enough. So um, when we think about the challenge, um, at the first hand, we have this challenge of combining uh, information from different modalities um, and do some reasoning over different modalities. But even more important challenge is to think about the common sense understanding of people, people's actions and uh, events that happen to people so that we can reason about what, why they are doing what they're doing and then think about how to help them better. So a lot of machine learning challenge is about not having this common sense representation of people and then get away with it uh, by just having a lot of labeled data and then just learn data set specific or task specific representations, but that doesn't really hold in this case because of the privacy concerns. We may not have the same kind of larger scale training data that a lot of deep learning models rely on today. So can we do something about this situation of understanding people? So let me give you a little bit of operating definition of common sense for now, which we might expand later. Um, but for now, let's just say to the basic level of a practical knowledge and reasoning, concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared by most people. So it doesn't have to be um, something that every single person agrees on, but it has to be something that a lot of people agree on. So for example, probably most people will agree that it's okay to keep the closet door open for some time, um, but not as okay to keep the fridge door open too long because food inside might go bad. You can always come up with some weird situation where um, this may not be true, but by and large, this is generally um, what people will agree on. So people do rely on this sort of understanding about the world in order to um, act safely and then interact with each other pleasantly. Um, as AI becomes more and more part of human lives, uh, it's important that AI do understand how we understand each other and our goals and um, emotional states and, for, and so forth. So um, the word common sense, by the way, is a crazy word. Um, a lot of people had this reaction that why do you work on it? It's just impossible. A lot of smart people worked on it in the past. It didn't work. So today I'm going to show you um, two pieces of our work that shows an entirely different approach that any of the previous research has uh, tried out and demonstrate that it might work this time around. So it's work presented at AAAI this year um, with uh, wonderful collaborators, including the lead author, Martin, who is doing internship at MSR this summer with Eric. Okay, so here's one really good example to think about. When you hear this event, X repels Y's attack. So for example, I repelled someone's attack in the street. What can you imagine about that situation? As a person, we can immediately think about a lot of causes and effects of that particular event. So for example, uh, perhaps I try to repel someone's attack because I wanted to protect myself or protect other people. You don't know which is true without additional context, but you can imagine that based on very uh, limited context, this, one of these is likely to be true. So this sort of reasoning is a stochastic. It's not like 100% with certainty. There's a lot of uncertainty. However, as a human, we will agree which of this is more likely. A lot of these other types of predictions have to do with 
effects or post conditions of the event. So for example, if you look at the bottom side, um, maybe as a result of my heartbeat might race, or I might feel angry, or I might punch back some more and so forth. So all these events are potentially possible and these are post conditions. And a lot of these um, predictions are about dynamic state changes, whereas some of these are about reasoning about the static aspect of the world. So for example, you know, my personality doesn't change every few minutes. So if I'm the kind of person who repels someone's attack, probably um, you know, I, I may be someone who's skilled physically or brave and strong. Um, some of these um, inferences are about voluntary actions, whereas some of these are involuntary um, reactions to the event. Some of these are about X, person X, uh, doing the action, whereas some of these inferences are about the other person Y or other people involved in the event. So there are different types of a hierarchy that um, uh, we can think about for any given event. So the purpose of this study was really to address this concern about current deep learning is a lot about curve feeding and then we don't really think about causes and effects. There probably are different ways of addressing this, but what we try to do is one way to do that. And we went fairly crazy to uh, collect almost 900 thousands of this sort of if then reasoning rules all in natural language. And uh, how did we get all of this? Um, so one could do unsupervised learning out of this um, unstructured text because there's a lot of text out there. But there's a practical concern that um, due to the reporting bias, if you count how many times people mother versus people exhale, if we just rely on text, then machine will think that we mother four times more often than we exhale, <laughs> which is unlikely to be true. So because of that, um, although combining both directions is a very good idea, just in this work, we went entirely with crowdsourcing so that we can see what we can possibly do if we have high quality, large scale data. So we had um, like 900,000 of this, um, and I'm going to now tell you what we can do once we have that. Um, for some reason, this slide doesn't really show fully. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Why is this broken? But anyway, so what I'm about to show you is now neural representation of a common sense that builds on this graph that I just presented. Um, and the work is going to appear at ACL this summer. So here's um, a bit of a philosophical statement about how to do this sort of like large scale knowledge graphs about our knowledge. Um, I will say that whatever we did um, with crowdsourcing, uh, it's not going to scale up to match the amount of knowledge that humans ever have. And in fact, maybe we don't really need to write down all of this per se, because if I ask you whether elephants are bigger than butterflies, you didn't need to write it down beforehand in order to answer my question correctly. You somehow have this model about the world which allows you to answer this question correctly. So that's what we really want to have in the end, a model that can reason about anything uh, that it hasn't really explicitly thought about before, uh, but still be able to reason about it, ideally in natural language, because that's the primary communication medium among people. So, um, but in order to get there, uh, it's likely that we need to do some kind of a transfer learning. Um, Chris was talking also about knowledge transfer across different data sets. Um, but we can also do transfer learning across language and knowledge, or language and different data sets as well, which is what I'm about to present um, in a bit. So the goal is to have neural models to train on part of the graph of the knowledge and then be able to reason about the rest of that it's never seen before. And it's built on top of um, uh, a model architecture known as a transformers. COMET stands for common sense transformers in particular, which combines um, the representation of language and knowledge such that now I'm going to skip over all this modeling part and then just tell you what kind of things it can reason. 
So it has never seen a sentence like Yejin tries to get the audience attention before, in part because the graph is all about person X doing something to person Y. It's not very compositional, and it doesn't have a people's name either. But just because these transformers have seen a lot of unstructured natural language text before during its pre-training, and then has been fine-tuned on the graph of knowledge, now we can actually reason about this. So you cannot see anything right now, but basically what happened is that given a, that uh, title sentence, it can reason about a lot of these common sense predictions that I'm going to now um, show you in more detail. So, so for example, maybe I did that because I wanted to give a presentation. It's interesting that the event doesn't even include the word presentation, but it's still able to predict my intent to being maybe I want to give a presentation. Um, before doing that, probably I needed to be prepared for it. And as a result, I may be seen as a, someone who is, um, uh, I don't know about smart, but maybe prepared and determined. Um, per effect on person X, so as a result, I might feel satisfied, happy. Uh, I don't think I'm nervous, but maybe some presenters do feel nervous. Um, per as a result, maybe I want to uh, give a speech, be heard, get attention, be noticed. Um, and then I may get yelled at, which hasn't happened yet, but I suppose I will receive some feedback eventually. So the predictions are not necessarily perfect, but it's fairly reasonable, I would say. Um, Alex drives his sister to the mall, for example. What happens? Well, maybe he wanted to be helpful. Maybe he um, wanted to make her sister, his sister happy. Um, he gets into the car beforehand. He needs to start the car. He needs to have the car. Um, he, as a result, um, will be considered to be helpful, caring, and generous, kind, and thoughtful. These are, again, machine predictions entirely, not perfect, but fairly promising, I would say, considering that this is just based on one paper so far. So um, it's able to predict that maybe I wanted to, um, uh, I, I will afterwards feel happy, helpful, satisfied. Others will also feel grateful as a result, and others may want to go shopping and so forth. How about another example? John gets into an accident. Um, maybe he feels hurt, scared, upset. That sounds reasonable. He can perhaps, uh, he wants to call 911 afterwards. So it can make a lot of reasonable predictions, common sense predictions in language, which perhaps we can then map down to some other programming um, style uh, representations for um, helping people to be more productive. So um, yet another one, she goes on a date with him, uh, maybe wanting to have fun, want to meet someone, uh, needs to get dressed up first or um, make plans and so forth. All right, so if you want to play with this, there's an online demo at mosaickg.apps.lnai.org or if you just search Comet uh, with my name and then LNAI, you will probably find this uh, site. All right, so to, as a quick recap, um, we um, uh, were thinking about this, how to improve a personal productivity, and then um, another challenge that I haven't talked about is the multimodality, but I'm going to be very brief here. It's uh, about the work that we presented at CVPR this year. And if you imagine a restaurant situation like this, um, current visual uh, recognition works well enough to recognize people correctly and a lot of objects correctly. But this really doesn't uh, make the machine really understand what's going on in the scene to be able to answer questions like, why is a person four pointing at person one in this particular scene? And here the answer is because um, he's telling the server that person one ordered that pancake as opposed to other options like he's feeling accusatory or giving someone directions. But you can imagine that in a restaurant setting, um, the correct answer is this. If it was in a meeting setting, maybe the correct answer is that, oh, maybe um, person one wants to uh, ask a question and you want to uh, draw attention to that person. So uh, the correct answer is all very contextual. And uh, this is sort of like a challenge uh, work that um, tries to uh, uh, encourage the computer vision people to think about how to uh, do this sort of a modeling better. So currently, human performance is very, very high, whereas our best model, R2C, which is a recognition to cognition network, um, is not very good. It's a 65, so a lot more work to be done. Um, this data set available at visualcommonsense.com present 
about 300 thousands of this sort of QA questions about images along with um, rationales that you have to answer correctly. So again, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of important and exciting challenges to address uh, for making this work. And I, although I didn't really talk about privacy, like how to better address it, due to the privacy, the practical implication of the privacy is so that we don't have the kind of data that a lot of neural network based uh, research assumes to be available. So because that's not the case, we do want the machines to be able to learn based on much less amount of data, which really um, makes this importance uh, um, of um, pre-training uh, model, pre-trained models that can generalize across the different situations. And one really important question that I want to uh, emphasize is how much can we get away without common sense knowledge or not modeling people at all? And perhaps we can try doing more of it um, with all this new resource about crowdsourcing and neural network and everything. Thank you. Thanks. So let me, let me invite the other speakers uh, back up while we also take a question for Eugene. So Chris and Chen, if you'd like to come. Is there a question for Eugene and specifically on this topic? Yeah, come on. So let me go ahead and, and ask one uh, about the common sense. So we think about this kind of structure as accelerating um, how much data we need to learn. Uh, so are there, you know, if you look at specific tasks of where common sense would help the most, things like looking at the next sentence somebody would write or other types of things, do we have a sense of where is big impact there and sort of if we re-ranked re by common sense where we see the largest impact? Right, so I would imagine that, I mean, eventually one can always hope that if we have extremely high quality common sense model, then it might help with anything. However, that's not going to be the case in all the years. So if we have a more limited um, common sense model that, for example, focus only on everyday events, then um, it's going to be probably more useful for the kind of a task where that sort of um, knowledge is important, which could be, for example, like human-robot interactions if uh, the robot is operating with um, language and uh, vision-based um, communication with the people, not necessarily manipulation. It's not going to improve manipulation in particular. But um, there are going to be also a series of benchmarks that um, my lab is about to release this summer. Some of them are already in the public domain, but there have been also an increasing number of common sense benchmarks coming out from NLP field as well more broadly. So those will be sort of the first target because those are good approximation that really um, expands the scope of what NLP techniques can actually do. A lot of the previous NLP research focused on like tagging and labeling and parsing. But going forward, I think we can really expand the scope if we push this direction uh, further. Thanks. Let's thank all the speakers again. So for the now uh, abbreviated portion uh, was going to be a panel discussion of some of the things. Uh, I have a set of pre-prepared questions, uh, but I'd also like to invite the audience to ask questions as well. So if you have a question um, uh, for the set of speakers to answer kind of in conjunction, feel free. Um, otherwise, so let's get the mic over there while I go ahead and, and fire into the, the first one. Hello, I, I have. Uh, just one second. Oh. Um, so, so one thing, I mean, hold on, hold on to the mic, that's fine. <laughs> one thing I did want to ask sort of in general when we think ab about this space across the board of how we're dealing with privacy either by reducing the amount of data through common sense or giving people um, other uh, programming means or maybe the case in you know, very personal scenarios is that it's less about privacy than really communicating what the benefits are and, and making sure that we're thinking about all the stu stakeholders, whether they're students or faculty more generally. What do you see as the research landscape to kind of push that area further um, beyond sort of just privacy-based methods, but thinking about how we interact with people? You can keep your mics on too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> right, so I mean, it seems that in order to really catalyze the research into that direction, um, like, uh, Jennifer said earlier, uh, we really like data. Data really attract us to work on it. And if there's a such data that's more about interaction with the users, which is really difficult to get for people in academia without the platform, 
So um, if there's something like that shared, that would really enable. Another possibility is at least having some kind of a simulation environment. It's not very satisfactory, but on the other hand, you also mentioned earlier about the use of reinforcement learning for as a learning framework. But to be honest, whenever reinforcement learning does work is when there's a simulation environment under which you can try million trials. Um, in order to really learn how to act, act. but without it, it seems that the progress is very, very slow. Yeah. All right, I'll take the question over there. Okay, uh, this is Peter Brusilovsky. Uh, I'm serving this year as a program chair of REXIS conference, and there was an interesting thing that uh, apparently the REXIS community is not considering that recommendation and prediction are the same things. And here we're mostly talking about recommendation in the sense of having a data and predicting what people do. Uh, and that's a pretty much work like KDD work, but in the recommender system community, people apparently think that it should be some value, some usefulness, and you can very easily predict where the person is going at 8 p.m. Uh, to the gym, right, and recommend him, hey, 8 p.m., you have to go to the gym, which will be completely useless, because the person will know that, right? So what do you think uh, on your side, working with data, how you would distinguish uh, prediction from existing data from recommendation? Actually, Jennifer provided some great example uh, when predicting when the current behavior will be completely pointless, right? But what is the take on this community? How we can turn out data and move beyond just predicting but doing something useful? I, I guess I can try to take that. Um, so I'm not... So I guess maybe I'm from the machine learning community that doesn't see the difference between recommendation and prediction. But I think if uh, uh, what I would like to say to that is I think it comes down to evaluating the results of your prediction in the right way. So like I said, it, and, and you mentioned, it's not helpful to predict or recommend the things that people have that they've already done because that's not novel to them. But you really need to focus on where's the types of predictions that you want to make, whether it's on people you haven't seen before, or people that or activities that they haven't done before, or that that's a very easy type of evaluation that I think we're all um, biased towards because of the availability to us to predict what's happening in the next time step, where we actually then can see the next time step, we can see the activity. I think what we need to move to, towards is something that is maybe more like a reinforcement learning kind of environment, where what we're really looking to do is maximize some longer term reward or behavior and trying to quantify what that is. And as we move towards that, um, and maybe we can use Chris's type of manual labeling uh, or labeling rules to get to what those rewards are in a low cost kind of environment. I think that's where we need to be moving towards as a field, whether you're saying that you're working on prediction or recommendation. I'll, I'll add two comments to that. One is on the reinforcement learning front. Things like the grade scenario is a great case of it. And also just who determines what the metrics are. So in the current um, setting in, in, in Purdue, it was the faculty and staff deciding what was in the best interest of the students, and even the likelihood that a student executes on something. If you elicit from them the goals, we know from social science literature, they're more likely to act on those goals just by the fact that you elicited it from them, right? So how do you bring those two together from a design point and what's going on? I think in terms of, of the Rexx community, it would be great to engage them further. Uh, I actually know several people who are trying to bring this type of work to the Rexx community, so I'm happy to take that discussion offline with you, Peter. So uh, last question, and I think we have to wrap up here. Question? Yes. Yes. I, just for the recording purposes, it's useful. Uh, Lucy Ports in University of Minnesota. So this is a, a question for Chris. So um, it all went by very fast. I promise I'll go try to read, but quickly. Um, were you suggesting that um, the weak supervision that you're um, putting forth with Snorkel, do you actually get an uncertainty on the models? Really excellent question. So I did, I did go through that part relatively quickly. We do actually estimate a full graphical model. Uh, pairwise interactions are typically what's done in practice. You do need a fair number of views of the correlations to be able to do that. But you have at the end of that estimation, without labeled data, uh, a distribution. Now, 
you know, what are the sort of downstream uses of sampling from that graphical model instead of using the marginals, and what is the benefit of using the higher order interactions? We've seen it in some cases. One case which was just recently in a Nature Comms paper was if you start to have really long range spatial or temporal correlations, then kind of obviously those higher level interactions that you're seeing inside, you know, you have a labeling function that's at one frame of a video versus at 10 frames, or, you know, what are, where's, where's the patient coming from? Those spans of correlations indeed are quite meaningful in being able to, to categorize video. Uh, in this case, it was looking at MRIs of, of hearts and being able to diagnose a rare, uh, semi-rare uh, aortic problem. So that's when those correlations are there. In general, in the first versions of the system, even though we have this, this kind of beautiful uh, graphical model that's laying there with all the parameters that you would want, even featureized, uh, we generally only kind of get the marginals out of it or run a kind of simple junction tree on it. But the distribution is there. So it's, it's a really interesting question. What does that uncertainty quantification actually tell you? And when is it behaving well or poorly? Yeah, and also as a diagnostic, when is it behaving well or poorly? There's clearly information in that. Uh, we just haven't exploited it in any way. It's a great question. All right, let's thank all the speakers again. Awesome.